Hi guys, we're going to talk about chapter 41. This is nursing care of the child with an alteration in perfusion um, and or our cardiovascular disorders. Cardiovascular disorders require acute interventions that often have long-term implications for the child's health and growth and development. Due to the overwhelming and devastating effects that cardiovascular disorders can have on children and their families, nurses really need to be skilled in assessment and interventions in this area and able to provide that support throughout the entire course of the illness and beyond. So let's get started here. So as we look to define perfusion, that really refers to the mechanism that facilitates the blood tissue. Alteration and perfusion are significant cause of chronic illness and death in children. Cardiovascular disorders can be, um, be categorized in two major categories, congenital versus acquired. Congenital heart disease is defined as a structural anomaly that are present at birth. Congenital heart defects account for the largest percentage of all birth defects. And these birth defects can be um, heart result in heart failure, chronic cyanosis, which can eventually lead to failure to thrive. When we look at the acquired heart diseases, um, these are disorders that occur after birth. Um, so things like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, rheumatic fever, those can all be disorders that we don't have at birth that we get after birth that can become an acquired heart disease. Or it develops from a wide range of causes um, or can occur as a complication as a long-term effect of congenital heart defect. So you can see those listed there as well. So when we look at circulatory changes from gestation to birth, um, we can note that the fetal heart rate is present around post-conceptual day 17. The four chambers of the heart and arteries are formed during gestational weeks two through eight. And during fetal development, um, oxygenation of the fetus occurs um, in the placenta. The lungs are perfused, but they do not usually perform oxygenation and ventilation. The foramen ovale is that opening between the atria which allows blood flow from the right to the left atrium. The ductus arteriosus allows blood flow between the pulmonary artery um, and the aorta, shunting blood away from the pulmonary circulation. Um, and you'll we'll kind of get into those um, as we get into our heart disorders. Both of these openings should close with that first breath of life. The lungs inflate, it reduces that pulmonary vascular resistance. The pulmonary artery pressure drops. Pressure in the right atrium decreases. The left atrium pressure increases. Changes and changes in that pressure closes that forum ovale. Changes in the pressure of the pulmonary artery closes that ductus arteriosus. The structural and functions Functions of the infant's child's cardiovascular system really differs from the adult, and it really is kind of dependent on the age of the child. In infants and children younger than seven, the heart lies more horizontally, but as the lungs grow over time, the heart is displaced downward. Between one and six years of age, the heart is four times the birth size, and between six and 12 years of age, the child's heart is 10 times the size it was at birth. The picture here on the slide shows you the change from fetal to neonatal circulation. So you can see there's lots of mixing of blood in that fetal circulation. As we continue to look at cardiovascular changes in childhood, the normal heart rate is higher in infancy than in adulthood, limiting that infant's ability to increase cardiac output by increasing the heart rate. You will see the heart rate decrease as the child ages. And you can also see that the average blood pressure is about 80 over 55. And this will slowly increase over time as um, they reach that adult level.
Some of the diagnostic tests we can think about for cardiovascular disorders includes pulse oximetry. That just helps determine oxygen requirements. Electrocardiogram or our ECG and Holter monitoring. This helps detect heart rhythm and chamber overload. Echocardiogram is a non-invasive ultrasound to help diagnose structural defects. Chest radiography is used to identify any abnormalities of the lungs, heart, and other structures in our chest. Exercise stress testing um, help quantifies exercise tolerance. It might help provoke symptoms or arrhythmias. Some of the labs that we can think about are our CBC, BMP, CRP, and ESR. And then arteriogram and cardiac catheterization observes that blood flow to parts of the body and detects any lesions. The catheter can be used to remove any plaques that might be noted. So as we look at cardiac cath, um, we can see that it's a definitive study for pre pediatric patients with cardiac disease. Cardiac catheterization has become almost a routine diagnostic procedure and can be done as an outpatient procedure. Um, typically, it helps identify those structural defects. Treatment is to dilate the occluded or stenotic structures or vessels and help close other defects. And it uses electrodes to identify abnormal rhythms and destroy those sites that are, have abnormal electrical conduct. So when we think about our cardiac catheter procedure, um, the procedure beforehand, um, we wanna make sure that we're note any fever, any signs and symptoms of infection. Any signs of infection would necessarily necessitate rescheduling that procedure. We want to review the child's medications. If the child for any reason is on any anticoagulants, we may need to hold that medication for several days prior to the procedure to help reduce any bleeding risk. We want to check hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, we want to assess the child's peripheral pulses. When we assess those pulses, um, we're going to probably mark the location of those pedal pulses so that they're easily assessed after the procedure. We're gonna teach the parent and the patient about the procedure and any complications. They do have to be NPO for four to six hours prior to this procedure. After the procedure, uh, we can um, need to lay them flat for about eight hours, evaluate their vital signs, make sure we're assessing neurovascular status, especially on those lower extremities, that's why it's a good idea to mark those pedal pulses so that we can um, detect those pulses. We want to assess pressure dressings over the cath site um, at least every 15 minutes for that first hour and then every 30 minutes for the next hour. Assess those distal pulses for presence and quality and then just maintain that bed rest. So as we think about discharging our patient after our cardiac cath, um, the education that's going to go with that is we want to change that pressure dressing on the day after the procedure. You want to apply a sterile dressing for the next several days, and we want to keep that dressing really dry. Cover it with plastic so that it doesn't get wet if they're showering. Um, inspect insertion site when changing the dressing. Resume their diet after the procedure. Check the child's temperature every day for about three days. Again, we're just monitoring any for any infection. We are gonna really make sure no tub baths for three days after the procedure. Um, it's okay to shower, but we have to have that plastic covering over the dressing. And then watch for any changes in appearance. If the child reports any fluttering or skipping of a beat, that needs to be reported to the provider immediately. Some of the common medical treatments that we can think about are oxygenation, um, if they've got any hypoxemia, respiratory distress, or heart failure, that oxygenation is going to help. Chest physiotherapy, um, it's, we're helping to immobilize some of those secretions that are in there, um, particularly after they've had some type of um, procedure, um, operation, anything like that. A chest tube might be a treatment, um, especially if they've had open heart surgery. And then pacing might be another treatment we can think about. Brady, bradyarrhythmias, heart block, cardio, cardiomyopathy, 
um, all of those things we not, might need to pace for. So just some common medical treatments that you might see. Some of the common medications um, are listed in a great chart in your book on page 1470. The ones that I'm gonna just really review are digoxin. Um, it increases contractility by decreasing conduction and increasing force. Some of the nursing implications are posted there, but remember that digoxin is given at very regular intervals. If a dose is missed, um, give it as soon as it's realized, or if it's too close to that next dose, we're gonna hold that missed dose. Furosemide is a loop diuretic. Um, it inhibits the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. So we usually use that a lot with our edematous patients that are usually associated with heart failure. And endomyocyte, Sorry, endomethacin is that last one, and it inhibits prostaglandin synthesis in order to close that patent ductus arteriosus. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get to our PDA section here. Um, just remember that, remember we take that first breath of life and that PDA, that um, opening should close, but if it doesn't close in the first few days, then we are gonna administer this endomethacin. So let's look at our nursing process here. When we're assessing a child um, with a cardiovascular disorder, um, we want to obtain that health history. Remember, assessment is that first process in the nursing process, um, or first st step in the nursing process. So we're gonna obtain a health history that might include present illness and past medical history. We're gonna get a physical examination and we're gonna prepare that child for any labs or diagnostics. As we start with the health history, we want to know um, when did those symptoms start and how have they progressed? Um, inquire about the treatments and medications used at home. Ask the parents about any history of orthopnea, dyspnea, easy fatigability, growth delays, squatting, edema, dizziness, frequent pneumonia diagnoses. Within the present illness, is there any poor feeding, fatigue, lethargy, vomiting, or failure to thrive? And then parents may also report diaphoresis, a delay in motor development, cyanosis, and tachypnea. And that's gonna give us a really great health history of that present illness that's going on. After we've collected all of the data that we need to know, then we're gonna do our physical examination and that's gonna include inspection, palpation, and auscultation, remembering that we're going from least invasive to most invasive. So you will need to obtain the child's vital signs, their height and weight to plot for nutritional status and growth. As you inspect, you're gonna assess the child's overall appearance. What does their skin look like? We're looking for any edema, any cyanosis, if that edema starts in the, the edema typically starts in the face, then the presacral region, then the extremities. Edema in the lower extremities may be very characteristic of right ventricular heart failure in our older children. We also want to look at the fingers and toes, and we're looking for clubbing, right? That's a sign of that chronic hypoxia, and we've talked quite a bit about that. We want to check for fever, because that would just be a really good indicator of infection. We want to note their chest or inspect their chest, noting any prominence of precordal chest wall that would indicate cardiomegaly. We also want to inspect the neck for visible engorged or abnormal pulsations. After we've done all of our inspection, then we're going to look at palpating. Um, we're going to palpate the pulses. Um, we're going to look at the rate and the rhythm. Um, the most accurate time to do that is if that patient is sleeping. Bounding pulses may indicate patent ductus arteriosus or aortic regurgitation. Thready pulses may occur with heart failure or severe aortic stenosis. We also want to palpate the abdomen for any distension, assess for any hepatomegaly. And then we're going to auscultate the last part of that physical examination. We want to auscultate the apical pulse, and we're going to do that for a full minute to determine rate and rhythm noting any irregularities, if it's tachycardic or if it's bradycardic. And then we also wanna to listen for, to, for any murmurs because those may need further evaluation.
So as we look at murmurs, this is just a brief look at murmurs. Many children do have functional or innocent murmurs, and all murmurs need to be evaluated based off location, relation to the heart cycle and the duration, what is the intensity. So grade one is a very soft, very hard to hear. Grade two is soft but easier to hear. Grade three is loud without a thrill. Grade four is loud with a precordial thrill. And grade five would be loud with a thrill. And usually it's audible with a stethoscope partially off of the chest. Grade six is that last one, very loud, audible with a stethoscope or the naked ear. We wanna note the quality, the variation um, with it, um, with, with positional changes. Um, so just making sure you're aware of just different murmurs that can happen, those grades, location, relation, all of that good stuff. So some of the congenital heart disorders that result in heart failure and hypoxemia are all listed here. Um, the ones that we're really gonna focus on for this chapter are VSD, the ventricular uh, septal defect, ASD, which is an atrial septal defect, PDA, which is our patent ductus arteriosus, tetralogy of full low, and TGA, which is our transposition of the great arteries. We may also hit a little bit on coarc of the aorta. So let's get started with some of these. So again, congenital heart disease affects about one third of infants. Um, they have a disease serious enough to result in death or require some type of cardiac cath. It's a major cause of death in that first year of life prematurity has a higher prevalence rate. It's the most common anomaly, or sorry, the most common anomaly is ventricular septal defect, and 28% of kids with CHD have another recognized anomaly. So when we think about the symptoms that we might see with congenital heart defect, um, we have to think about the why. Structures that formed to allow fetal circulation may have failed to close after birth, altering the pressures necessary to maintain adequate blood flow. After birth, newborn pressures gradients within the heart and pulmonary system are necessary for adequate circulation to the lungs and the rest of the body. If these pressure gradients become disrupted due to either structure failing to close, narrowing, or transposition of vessels, then that systemic circulation becomes compromised. And you can see some of the general symptoms that we're gonna see with all of our congenital heart defects. So let's start with our categories of the congenital heart defects. Um, we can categorize them by hemodynamic and blood flow patterns. The first one that we're gonna talk about is decreased pulmonary blood flow. And this is right to left shunting. It occurs when there is some obstruction of blood flow to the lungs. Typically, children will exhibit low oxygen saturation levels, ranging from about 50 to 90%, which can produce severe cyanosis. To compensate for the low blood oxygen, the kidneys produce increased amount of erythropoietin to stimulate the bone marrow to release more RBCs. This increase in RBCs is called polycythemia. Tetralogy and fallot and tricuspid are atresia are our decreased pulmonary blood flow disorders. So here are our disorders, tetralogy of Fallot, tricuspid atresia. Um, remember these patients are cyanotic and we're just gonna focus on that tetralogy of Fallot for this chapter. So tetralogy of Fallot is a congenital heart defect composed of four heart defects. You have pulmonary stenosis, the blood flow from the right ventricle is obstructed and slowed, which decreases the blood flow to the lungs for oxygenation and decreases in the amount of oxygenated blood returning to the left atrium from the lungs. This obstruction also increases the pressure in the right ventricle. So that's our next one is our um, right ventricular hypertrophy because of that increased pressure in that right ventricle. The blood that is poorly unoxygenated is now being shunted across a VSD, which is your third heart defect into the left atrium. 
The poor oxygenated blood also travels through the overriding aorta. So there's your fourth one is that overriding aorta. A mixing of the oxygenated and poorly oxygenated blood occurs, which is ultimately being pumped into the systemic circulation. This mixing blood in the systemic circulation reduces our oxygen saturation, which leads to cyanosis for these patients. Tetralogy of flow is usually diagnosed during the first few weeks of life, if not the first few days of life. The cyanosis worsens with that pulmonary stenosis. Systolic murmur is present. Most infants with tetralogy of flow have a PDA at birth, providing additional pulmonary blood flow and decreasing that initial cyanosis. But as the ductus arteriosus closes, more severe cyanosis can occur. Hypercyanosis, blue spells or tet spells develop suddenly and worsen with increased cyanosis, hypoxemia, dyspnea, and agitation. So when we think about those hypercyanotic spells, how do we relieve those? Um, we can use a very calm, comforting approach. We can place the infant or child in a knee to chest position. That's also called a squatting position. Specific postures will help improve that pulmonary blood flow by increasing systemic vascular resistance. We can provide supplemental oxygen, administer morphine sulfate, apply IV flu or supply IV fluids, and administer propanolol. And all of those will help just relieve some of those hypercyanotic spells that these tetralogy of fallow patients will experience. So when we're doing our physical examination on these patients, we wanna note skin color and any evidence of cyanosis. We also want to observe the fingers for clubbing, auscultate the heart, noting a loud, harsh murmur is characteristic of this disorder. And you can see our little guy there um, in that squatting position um, because that's comforting during that TET spell or that hypercyanotic spell. So other things that we might see are that squatting, cyanosis, clubbing, and maybe even syncope. So the next one that we're going to talk about is increased pulmonary flow. Um, this is left to right shunting. The blood flowing to the lungs is large. The child may develop heart failure early in life. Increased pulmonary blood flow results in decreased system blood flow. So sodium and fluid retention may occur. Oxygen supplementation is really not helpful. The oxygen acts as a pulmonary vasodilator. And if we already have a great amount of blood in the pulmonary system, this may cause greater flow, causing tachypnea, lung fluid retention, and even greater issues. PDA, ASD, and BSD are, are increased pulmonary blood flow disorders. So you can see those listed here, and we are gonna go through each of those. So remember that these are um, acyanotic defects and there is that left to right shunting. Um, again, PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, ASD, atrial septal defect, and VSD, ventricular septal defect. And again, um, common symptoms that we're gonna see with each of these are increased fatigue, murmurs, increased risk of endocarditis, um, congestive heart failure, and even growth retardation. So let's start with atrial septal defect. Um, an atrial septal defect is a hole in the wall or the septum that divides the right atrium from the left atrium. Shunting increases that blood flow, um, entering the right atrium, leading to increased blood flow into the lungs. If the ASD is small enough, it may, be, it may spontaneously close within the first 18 months. If it is not closed by age three, surgical repair will be warranted. When you auscultate the heart, you'll hear a fixed split second heart sound with a systolic ejection murmur. Um, palpating the sternal border for a right ventricular heave, and that's due to that right ventricular hypertrophy um, because we just have more blood flow there. <laughs> 
Management um, EKG is done to confirm diagnosis. If the defect is small, it may be sutured closed. Larger defects may require a patch of pericardium or synthetic material. After surgery, nurses will monitor for atrial arrhythmias. If the surgery is not elected, the patient is definitely at risk for endocarditis that could lead to heart failure. The most common heart defect here is our ventricular septal defect, um, and it accounts for about 30% of all congenital heart defects. VSD is an abnormal opening between the right and left ventricle. There's right to left shunting, resulting in that Einsmenger syndrome, or pulmonary hypertension and cyanosis. Spontaneous closure occurs in about half of the children by the age of two. Surgical repair has good outcomes, and repairs of large defect is recommended to prevent development of pulmonary disease. Auscultation of the heart will note a holist, holosystolic harsh murmur along that left sternal border. And we do want to palpate that chest for the thrill. Remember, this is left to right shunting. So increases the right ventricular pressure, causing hypertrophy, leads to that right ventricular failure. MRI or echocardiogram may reveal the opening as well as the extent of that left to right shunting. Management, 60% of VSD closes spontaneously during that first year. Cardiac cath can be done to close the defect. Open heart surgery is required if we have larger defects. And the last one that we're going to talk about is patent ductus arteriosus. Um, this is a failure of that fetal ductus arteriosus to close within that first week of life, really within that first breath, um, and then we're going to attempt medication, and then it may still not be closed. As a result, that connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta should close at birth with that first breath. Normally, that closes within 10 days of birth. If it doesn't close with that first breath, um, complete closure may take up to about three months. Endomethacin is that in, um, prostaglandin inhibitor that synthesizes the closure of that PDA. So if we don't get it closed in the first breath, it's not closed within the first 10 days of life, um, we're definitely going to be thinking about that endomethacin. Failure of the ductus arteriosus to close leads to continued blood flow from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. Blood returning to that left atrium passes to the left ventricle, enters the aorta, travels to the pulmonary artery via that PDA instead of entering into the systemic circulation. This altered pattern increases the workload of the left side of the heart. Pulmonary vascular congestion does occur. On physical examination, you might see a diastolic blood pressure low because of that shunting. Um, the left ventricle is going to be enlarged. When you auscultate the lungs and the heart, you may hear rails if there's heart failure. You'll hear a harsh, continuous, machine-like murmur loudest under that left clavicle. Labs and diagnostics and medications, um, we can think about our EKG or ECG, which will reveal the extent of the defect and confirm our diagnosis and then the chest x-ray might demonstrate that cardiomegaly. As far as treatment and nursing care, um, we're hoping that it will spontaneously close um, during that first year, um, but if it doesn't, we know um, we've got some medications and or surgical intervention. We're gonna give that endomethacin, which is that medication administration. We may need to surgically repair. We'll do prophylactic antibiotics to keep infection rates low. Um, when really what we're trying to do is prevent any congestive heart failure. So the third category that we're going to talk about is obstruction um, to blood flow. Um, this is a narrowing of a major vessel interfering with the ability of the blood to flow freely through that vessel. Peripheral circulation or blood flow to the lungs is affected. Some of the um, obstructive disorders that we can think about are coarctation of the aorta, aortic stenosis, 
in pulmonary um, stenosis. So again, here are our obstructive disorders. Remember these disorders involve some type of narrowing of a major vessel that interferes with the ability of blood to flow freely through the vessel. And we're gonna just focus on that coarctation of the aorta. So coarctation of the aorta is a narrowing of the aorta, the major blood vessel carrying highly oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the body. This accounts for about 4.2 to 6% of congenital heart defects, and it occurs three times more in males than in females. Coarc of the aorta occurs most often in the near, in the area near to the ductus arteriosus. So we've already talked about that, right? Now we've gotten past that PDA, but now we have a narrowing of that vessel. Two locations that are common are preductal type and in infantile and postductal type um, in the older patient. Left ventricular over afterload is increased, which might lead to that heart failure. So we need to determine the health history, noting any concerns with irritability or frequent epistastics. Uh, older children may report leg pain with activity, dizziness, fainting, and headache. Pulses will be bounding in those upper extremities and weak or absent in the lower. Blood pressure may be higher in the upper extremity compared to the lower. Nurses do need to inspect notching of the ribs, especially in those school age children. And auscultation of the heart is gonna hear a soft or moderately loud systolic murmur. So management is going to include um, balloon angioplasty via cardiac cath. Um, most common surgical repair is resection of the narrowed portion of that aorta, followed by end-to-end -end reanastomosis. And the last category that we're going to talk about is our mixed blood flow. This involves a mixing of well oxygenated blood with poorly oxygenated blood. Systemic blood flow contains lower oxygen content and cardiac output is decreased and heart failure does occur. So you can see the examples um, of our mixed blood flow disorders, transposition of the great vessel, total anomalous pulmonary venous return, truncus arteriosus, and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So again, remember these are mixing of well oxygenated blood with poor oxygenated blood, and we're just gonna focus on that transposition of the great vessel. So transposition of the great vessel is a heart defect in which the pulmonary artery and the aorta are transposed from their normal positions. The aorta arises from the right ventricle instead of the left, and the pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle instead of the right. It is often diagnosed within the first few days of life um, when the newborn infant manifests cyanosis. When that ductus arteriosus closes, the symptoms actually worsen. Corrective surgery is usually performed four to seven days of age. So this is a very serious um, defect um, that has to be taken care of pretty, pretty quickly. Unless there is a connection somewhere in the circulation where the oxygen rich and oxygen poor blood can mix, all organs in the body are being poorly oxygenated. Clinical, clinical assessment is gonna reveal significant cyanosis without a murmur. Remember those are transposed. Um, they may have very shortness of breath, poor feeding, and then clubbing of those fingers and toes because of that just chronic hypoxemia, even in those first few short days of life. An EKG is clearly gonna reveal evidence of that transposition. So that is all of our congenital heart defects that we're gonna talk about. Now we're gonna to move to our acquired cardiovascular disorders. And these occur in children as a result of an underlying cardiovascular issue or may refer to other cardiac disorders that are not congenital. 
Heart failure is the most common acquired cardiovascular disorder. Other, others include um, rheumatic fever, cardiomyopathy, endocarditis, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, Kawasaki's disease, and we're going to discuss um, several of these here. We're going to discuss infective endocarditis, acute rheumatic fever, hypertension, and Kawasaki's disease in addition to heart failure. So heart failure occurs most often in children with congenital heart disease and is the most common reason for admission to the hospital for children with this. Heart failure refers to a set of clinical signs and symptoms that reflect the heart's inability to pump effectively to provide adequate blood, oxygen, and nutrients to the body's organs and tissues. Infants often display subtle signs such as difficulty eating or tiring out quickly. Tachycardia and tachypnea are often the first indicators of heart failure for infants and children. Management is supportive. We do want to make sure we're promoting oxygenation. So we're administering oxygen as ordered. Oxygen serves as that vasodilator and decreases that pulmonary vascular resistance. We want to support their cardiac function. Medication therapy is going to begin really closely monitoring that blood pressure. Um, we're going to provide adequate nutrition and promote rest. Infective endocarditis is a bacterial infection of the endothelial surface of the heart. It usually occurs in the valves, which is the most common, the chamber walls or the septum. Children with um, CHD or prosthetic valves are at high risk for acquiring bacterial endocarditis, which can potentially be fatal. Complete antibiotic or antifungal treatment is necessary and this treatment may last four to six weeks. These medications will be given systemically through a central line. So they will probably go home with a PICC line, um, a Hickman, something. Um, so being aware of any infectious process is vital and that is what we need to teach our parents. Acute rheumatic fever is a delayed outcome of group A strep. Um, that group A pharyngeal strep. It usually develops two to four weeks after that initial strep infection. The child can develop antibody response to the proteins of that bacteria, and then these antibodies cross react with antigens in the cardiac muscle, causing carditis and arthritis. Nursing management is going to include ensuring compliance with antibiotics, as well as prophylaxis following initial recovery offering support for any discomfort by administering corticosteroids or your NSAIDs for joint pain and swelling. Um, and then you can see some of the major criteria and minor criteria for acute rheumatic fever on your slide there. Hypertension is the next type of acquired cardiovascular disorder that we can talk about. There is a rise in hypertension among children and adolescents. Primary hypertension is that post-pubertal children, African-Americans, overweight or obese, and then secondary hypertension is our underlying medical problems such as renal or cardiac disease. Physical examination, we're going to measure that blood pressure in all four extremities so that we can rule out any co of the aorta. As far as nursing management, it's going to really focus on nutritional education. We're going to control portion sizes, decrease sugary beverages and snacks, you help them eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, encourage healthy breakfasts, and we're gonna really restrict any salt intake for these patients. So the last acquired cardiovascular disorder I wanna hit on is Kawasaki's disease. This is acute systemic vasculitis, which occurs in children six months to five years. This is the leading cause of our acquired heart disease among children and often occurs in the winter months and in the summer months. It is self-limited, but can cause cardiovascular complications such as coronary artery aneurysm and cardiomyopathy. Therapeutic management is gonna focus on the reduction of inflammation in the walls of coronary arteries and preventing that coronary thrombosis. In addition to administration of aspirin and immunoglobulin, nursing management is also going to include 
um, monitoring that cardiac status. Um, we may need to do some IV or oral fluids as ordered and evaluate intake and output very carefully. We're going to prepare the child for an echocardiogram, assessing for any signs of developing heart failure, which might include tachycardia, a gallop, or respiratory distress. We are gonna also promote comfort, acetaminophen or ibuprofen for fever, keeping the environment quiet and calm to decrease any stimulation and irritability, and comforting positions if that child is experiencing any joint pain or arthritis. And then we also wanna provide lots and lots of education for our family. They're gonna to need to monitor temperatures very closely. Um, how are they gonna cope with the irritability from their child? reporting any toxic effects of aspirin therapy, avoiding NSAIDs while on the aspirin therapy, and keeping regularly scheduled cardiology follow-ups. When we look at them and do our physical assessments, our examination, signs and symptoms are going to include high fever for about five days that are really unresponsive to antibiotics, um, chills, malaise, extreme irritability, headache, um, they do have these distinct rashes. Um, they have that big strawberry tongue, and they have palmar erythema. They do have some skin disquamation, which is just that peeling of their perineum, fingers and toes. They may have some aneurysms or some abdominal and joint pain. So we can do some Tylenol or acetaminophen for any fever management if that is warranted. So nursing care focuses on focusing on cardiac disorders. We want to improve oxygenation. We want to promote adequate nutrition, assist the child and family with any coping, provide post-op nursing care, prevent infection, and then making sure that we're really educating our families before they go home. Psychosocial interventions might include explaining what is happening with that child. Um, use the language um, that the parent and the child can understand. Throw all your lingo, your medical jargon, all of that out the window and really talk down um, to what is really happening with that child. Allow the parents and child to voice their feelings, concerns, or questions. Make sure you're providing ample time to address questions and concerns, and then encourage that parent and child as developmentally appropriate to participate in all cares. As far as nutrition, um, we've talked about making sure they have adequate nutrition. That's going to help foster growth and development. Congenital heart defects typically have increased nutritional needs because of that increased energy expenditure that they have with that increased cardiac and respiratory workload. Nutrition is provided for children with cardiac disorders. It could be orally, enterally, or parenterally. And that concludes Chapter 41. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we will chat, chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.